What about the brain then, the parts of the brain that are associated with things such as bipolar and different personality disorders and ADHD, some of those neurodivergencies? Yes. What, what, what are the parts of the brain that affect <laughs> those or trigger those or cause those or are impacted by those? Yeah. I mean, I think if we had an answer to that, and that's why I like this Chris Palmer, because what they see... I mean, there's certain, you know, I think the labels are convenient. Um, you know, yes, autism I agree. is great. And I think there's so many overlaps, you know, particularly yes. with neurodiversity. And it's so complicated in terms of the relationship of neurotransmitters to, you know, metabolic things, which are also interrelated, that, that everything is so correlated and the brain never operates in isolation so some people used to think of like the you know oh my lizard brain did it we don't have a triune brain it's all connected at all times and so maybe they're fighting for attention you know <laughs> one one part is going to say i want to you know but in reality it's this interconnectedness so they're seeing several things at the macro level it's sort of like patterns right mm -hmm. patterns of things of connections and again what does that mean certain patterns um at the micro level it's this maybe it's neurotransmitters but they can't take your blood and say you have to too little serotonin, right? There's no diagnostic for this. I always say in like 100 years, they're going to equate some of the things we've been doing to bloodletting because it's just, it's roulette. They're just saying, try this, see if it works. Try this, see if it works. I like the metabolic thing because it's an umbrella for almost every mental illness, even seizures, wow. because... So that idea, you know, in the twenties, they did this kind of ketogenic diet where they deprived the brain of glucose, right? And that cured seizures. And so um, that's, that's, that's a treatment that they still use mm -hmm. for people with seizures who, you know, they have to have no, no carb, zero carb, just keto, just to, their energy comes from ketones. Um, I know we're getting into the weeds, but I think we can, every individual is different. I know yes. for me now that my depression, how I handle it's know thyself. It is, I have to not, I have to shift interoception. I have to experience extra reception dissociation through, you know, I have to balance that because I can get mm -hmm. two in my head and ruminating. Yes. I know my anti-inflammatory when my I'm inflamed, I am much more prone. I know when I haven't gotten sleep, I'm much more prone. So it's sort yes. of like I keep, I do my own science experiment. Yes, likewise, <laughs> likewise. Right? I, I, yeah, yeah. I look at my triggers too. And, and yeah. sleep is a big one for me. If, if I don't yeah. sleep properly, I, right. can, I will cry yes. literally <laughs> at the drop of the hat. I am highly emotional. Right. If I don't sleep well. Right. And stress does that too. So the one brain thing I can say that's, that is location is that when we have a lot of cortisol or stress, there's this shift in who takes control, who's holding the steering wheel and the one that's reactive and, and emotional or impulsive will take over because stress means danger means I got to react. And mm. so I think that's where you can start to see some patterns of of location or you know they call it you know our executive function our prefrontal cortex all these things that can dominate and control keep things under wraps will then get ganged up on by the parts of the brain they're going nope i am in an emergency girl you know yes, yes. i'm gonna take over you can't drive anymore so i think those are the kinds of things that they do know in terms of parts and relationships mm. Because there's no brain imaging equipment, is there? There's nothing that we can... <sighs> Although, sorry, Dr. Yeah. Daniel Arman, is it? Okay. You, he, he has some sort of imagery thing that he uses to look at the brain and see if there's brain um, damage. Yeah. So and, they do. Yeah. yeah. yeah sorry. And, and I love that anyone that his daughter dates... He yes. puts them <laughs> under that machine. Just... 
<laughs> Talk about the like inquisition, right? Like, oh my gosh, if that technology is going to be like, because pretty soon they're going to have, you know, fMRI, they already have headsets like you could just have in your house. I'm going to, yep, come on in, boys. I'm going to put this on your head. <laughs> So the thing about imagery is you're you're checking this is going to get maybe too scientific. You're you're That's right. every imagery is checking for a different thing. So MRI, fMRI is blood flow. So what does that tell you? Well, those things in that moment are getting attention from blood, which means oxygen, which means energy. So those regions are getting energy. But the time scale of it that's what we have to revisit is that if anyone's been to a planetarium, I know when I go and they say like, this is a million light years and this is 10 billion light years. I have no concept of yeah. the difference, right? It's like, it's big as, f <laughs> big. I'm sorry, <laughs> right? It's like, it's like, all I know is that is a lot. It's a lot. And, and so it's same thing in reverse. So what fMRI is limited is that you're taking an image when the blood's already there and the time scale is much bigger and not precise you don't know whether that's happening after the thought or at the thought or in this kind of slices of time which is how the brain operates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's where some of the imaging is not helpful in terms of some of these things that we feel are so quick and are even predictively quick in terms of the vocal research, which is what I love, is that they do it on open brain electrodes. So the person's brain, they're doing it on seizure patients. So all of the vocal motor mapping was on people who had their brains exposed in surgery with electrodes on. And unfortunately, we can't do that kind of imagery for the, the things that we're talking about. Yes, yes. <laughs> because I think what he was referring to when I listen to back, when I think back to his interviews is that there are times a person presents with certain poor behaviors, poor habits, addictions. And mm -hmm. we think that that person can be, let's just label them as a bad person. Mm -hmm. They do things that are not good. They make not good choices. Yeah. They're impulsive and or they're yeah. impulsive. Yes. Or they can be violent. And he has said that he's proven that a lot of the time when you put these people under these brain imaging equipment, these scans, or I think it's a scan. Yeah. That he finds that there is actual brain damage, that there is something physically going yeah. on with the brain that impacts that person's behavior yeah that triggers that behavior that causes that behavior right. and by improving that person's brain health and there yes. are ways to improve brain health that that person changes their behavior over a period of time and often we can sustain a brain injury yes without realizing it could have been a bump on the head as a kid. It could have been a concussion. It could have been on the football field. It could have been yes. on the snow fields, whatever it is. Yeah. We, we could have actually sustained a brain injury and not known about it. That's causing a lot of that behavior or those symptoms that we're experiencing. Right. Yes, TBI, the traumatic brain injury field, particularly for American football, is huge. And unfortunately, they can't image that in, except for post-mortem because it's these small proteins. So, But there's a lot of suspicion of people who have had these behavioral changes from head injury that they have this kind of brain damage. So there's the micro damage and then there's the macro damage. And the reversibility... Again, there's some things that are reversible and some things not. But what I like about this brain health, brain metabolism, particularly with like something like schizophrenia, is that this change is so dramatic for someone like that. When you optimize the brain health and then you see depression or bipolar or schizophrenia alleviated through that it's very empowering. So I think, you know, it's so complex. It's sort of like just saying the word cancer, you know, there are so many kinds yes. of cancers. There's so many kinds of brain 
issues that I think, you know, it, what I'm hoping for is that the wild type, we call it wild type, you know, the people who we have a range of mental illness and things that are changeable to provide that empowerment mm. to do that. Yeah. So does our brain health impact things such as decision making? <laughs> a thousand percent because we're making decisions again in that predictive way we're weighing information to you know impulsivity is huge right and and there are people who even it's a side effect of antidepressants to be honest with you i was actually more suicidal on higher dose ssris which is ironic but that's a black box warning on them it actually has the warning that in some people oh. because you're increasing, you know, you're trying to, you're, you're shifting the balance of serotonin. And when you do that, there's an impulsivity associated with that. Mm. Um, and so that, you know, again, it's knowing thyself, communicating with your doctor, if you're taking meds and you're having these kinds of feelings to know that, you know, maybe I need to try something else or lower the dose. But so decision-making is affected by brain chemistry for sure and experience. And so I think that's something, again, it, in the moment, you know, it's like the five second rule, right? It's, it's love you it. know. Love <laughs> Mel you? Robbins. Yes, <laughs> love. Right, so we need that five second rule sometimes in decision-making to sort of take stock, you know, whether you're sending an email, I was the queen of like babbling emails and it's like, send, <laughs> it's like, no, you do like, Kurt would say, my husband would say, you know, strong verb, short sentences. You don't need to write like, you know, a 5,000 word essay when you're sending an email about something. You Can know? you tell some of the people on the social media forums in our yes. voice community <laughs> to stop? Can actually, yeah. I've never sworn. Oh, oh you're going to swear. Oh. I'm going to swear. Sometimes yeah. I want to say, shut the fuck up. <laughs> It's Can like you, you have to say that in two words that everyone understands. Like yes, it's a, it's like a stop, PhD what, thesis. What are you trying to prove here? Like yes. just shut up. Oh. Yes, I call it. I have another naughty term for it. It's not okay. a swear, but it's it's an. I call it intellectual masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> we call that a wanker in Australia. Yes. <laughs> Because that's what they're doing. It's like, if you're writing something that long, it's really not for the purpose of educating. No. You know? Yeah. And, and all I admit, the people I, that engage with it, stop yeah. feeding the ego. Yeah. And I admit, I can be guilty of that when I'm enthusiastic about something. Oh, yes. And so I have to sort of temper that. But I think I can tell the difference between people There's who are just enthusiastic no. versus look at all that I know in one post, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. And we're getting way off the track. And okay, you made sorry. me swear. I did. I feel, all your I feel pride and guilt all at the same time. So you, <laughs> we can analyze that thought process. What are those okay. like angel and devil? Pride yes. and guilt. Okay. Yes, yes <laughs> exactly. So what about the brains of people that have addictions? Like alcoholism, yes. gambling, I've heard a very interesting thing very recently about people with alcoholism having a thing called wet brain. Ah, yeah. Where it starts to impact their memory and they start to develop symptoms, not unlike someone with Alzheimer's or dementia. Yes. So again, I'm not an expert, but I can speak to the fundamental principle of what addiction is and even phone addiction, to be honest with you, people who are on uh -oh. their phones all the time. Mm -hmm. So we evolved a wonderful, wonderful system. Now dopamine and serotonin do two, you know, a lot more things than this. So I want to have that caveat. They're not solely for these two things, but dopamine is something that say if i'm a hunter gatherer a cave person and i am hungry i have not eaten for days i have high dopamine that motivates me to go look for food right now once i find it 
serotonin comes along and says, you found it, now you're happy. I don't need that much dopamine anymore. The dopamine actually drops below baseline when you find the food. So it's below the normal level. So that way you stay where you found the food and you eat it and you enjoy it and you bond with your community and you know you get a good night's sleep, right? There's reasons why you want your dopamine after that hit to go below baseline because you need to stay where you are, get sleep and eat. Now, what happens with addiction is it's a dopamine hit, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. It has a chem chemistry that increases your dopamine. Yes. And every time you get a hit, that goes, it goes below baseline. So you're going to need more to get at the level that you wanted before. And you repeat that process. You're never getting the rest period of where dopamine is just not being triggered. And I think that's where that whole memory, because the system's not wired to have it on all the time. It's like leaving your electricity on all day. You know, your battery's mm -hmm. gonna run out. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think people, because things like sleep, all these other chemical things that need to have this variation are just on overdrive all the time. Mm. And yes. so that's sort of what that is. And and as I said, phones are doing it to kids right now. You know, over too much light, too much stimulation will trigger that and then you're never getting that it's always going below and you need more and more and more and more mm -hmm. i have someone close to me at the moment mm -hmm. who and and i can clearly see this whole dopamine thing playing out where this yeah. person is constantly seeking those dopamine hits without realizing yeah. i can see the behavior for example right. that person will be on their phone on social yeah. media playing some kind of video that's been yeah. uploaded where there's a lot of like yelling and swearing and or activity or yes. loud music but we'll also have the tv on in the background oh, yeah. with game of thrones <laughs> or like... walking dead <laughs> and then with some alcohol yeah that is just and yeah. i'm just and for me see i'm the opposite I like right. quiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually believe it or not, I don't really engage much on social media, even though I'm on there all the time. I have someone do it for me because yeah. I don't deal with social media. I like calm. Yeah, but I can I, see this dopamine. I mean, because people don't realize even scary movies right. give you those dopamine hits. Yeah. And, it, and, and for things like that, there's another thing, there's the adrenaline component, right? So then you're adding a, you know, a more complex thing because adrenaline and stress, that's what scary movies do and violence. And those kinds of things are increasing adrenaline. So then yes. you get that response as well. So there's all of these things that are, again, not our cave person biology they're no. they're added in our social structures that are actually doing damage to humans our tension spans have gone way down because of that you know people don't sit and read That's and talk person. or make music. yeah <laughs> right as well attention span of a snow pea <laughs> of a what a snow pea <laughs> I've never heard that. i love that i made that up I love it. I'm going to steal it. The attention yeah. span of a snow pea. Everyone put that in the vernacular. It's perfect. <laughs> I want to see that in the dictionary next. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, yeah. So that's what we're doing to ourselves. And I think even the news cycle, right? We're getting, you know, when I was growing up, you know, we had two TV stations. There was news only once in a while. Think of all of the stress we have by knowing what's go all the horror that is going on i mean it's important mm -hmm. to be knowledgeable about the world but when we're just constantly everything's apocalyptic that is not healthy for our biology i do yeah. news fasts i do social media fasts that's hard for me but i i know it when i'm on social media too long i get depressed i know it i'm saying it out loud but i do it anyway and it's 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 this terrible terrible process that I think we're all a part of that fabric and it's really hard to break because it's integrated in our culture, especially yes. for our kids, you know, um, they can't yeah. switch off. 
They mm -mm. cannot switch off. And and you have to know and be self-aware as well. Like for me, I can't watch any any action shows, any horror, any suspense, anything that has bad news at night time after yes. it's, say 7.30 at night. Yeah. I watch reality TV show that is so brain numbing <laughs> and people, people do not believe that I watch all the real housewife shows. <laughs> I watch below deck. I yes. watch all those shows and they put me to sleep. Yeah. See, and that's the background. I, it's like, because if you were a cave person, you would have that natural human drama going on in the background as you were sleeping oh. you'd have some real housewives that were cave people wow that's with new jersey I, accents because yeah. i'm from new jersey yeah i oh you're <laughs> no they're crazy people yeah <laughs> but they're that's what i'm saying it's like i do i'm the same way like i'll have sometimes i have to fall asleep with background humans talking in some way because i'm not processing the information i'm just hearing the social thing you know mm -hmm. i'm not alone or isolated you know? yes and one thing we haven't touched on is cortisol how does that impact yeah I, the cortisol it's actually an adrenal um secretion it's not in the brain but it impacts the brain and cortisol isn't all bad it gets a bad rap it's it's we need it for learning you need a little bit of stress to motivate you you need a little you always get a little cortisol hit in the morning um but the effect of chronic stress and chronic cortisol is that it it floods the system right it it, it um and that mm -hmm. can lead to yeah and that actually lowers high cortisol lowers dopamine so then it takes over as like the energy source it's like the stress energy so there's a difference between normal happy energy that's sort of you know versus stress energy we all feel it you know when you're hyped up from stress not from what is a natural you know i mean stress is natural but mm. the body's on alert with cortisol so it is energetic but it's not the energy you want <laughs> i know chronically right you yeah. don't want the stress energy all yes. the time yes because you, i i have been in that state and you can actually feel it physically moving through your body it's like electric currents yes running through your body i had that after i finished my phd because oh. i was doing that on a full-time load while i was working full-time <gasps> and i was oh in that state for a quite a fixed amount of time, long period of time. So yeah. it was really hard to switch off even after I pressed send. Yes. <laughs> submit. I, it, I didn't realize the impact that was going to have in, in, in my cell structure of my body. So For sure. What are the smallest things we could do today to help mm -hmm. us improve our brain health and our mindset? I think first, and this is the hardest, but the day we have these natural peaks and valleys in our energy level during the day, I think we need this kind of idea of back to back to back to back to back, hours and hours and hours of work without breaks is not good for our brain health. And it's hard when you need, when you're living in a society that way, I do try to schedule chunks of lessons rather than a swath of you know um that's just for me so i think mm. it's how we structure our day because the brain needs time to rest rest is where actually memory is consolidated and memory doesn't just have to be what you're learning memory is just existing as a human and processing and when you're attending all the time you're not getting that brain where the hippocampus goes communicates with the neocortex and they have this little party where things get consolidated so you're missing out on a really important i have a little youtube video on that on what is happening during rest not just sleep it happens during sleep but little rest during the day. And it doesn't take much. You mm. can do five minutes, 10 minutes, but it has to be non-attentive. You can go for a walk. That's the optic flow kind of rest. You can meditate, but we don't do enough of that. And our brains are then getting depleted metabolically. 
Mm. Um, diet, of course, you know, processed things and, you know, people think glucose, why are, you know, glucose is brain energy. My brain needs that too much glucose feeds the inflammatory cells too. And it's those guys that are creating these cytokines and all of these uh, inflammatory things that will flood the brain and create, like I get migraines. As soon as I started cutting, paying attention to brain metab metabolism, my mood improved. I didn't get migraines as much. My Bell's palsy wasn't as hyper. So we can do a lot with diet, yes. but you have to know thyself that can, it's yes. not, you know, not just overall health and, and exercise, but I think Think, think like a cave person. That's going to be my TED talk. <laughs> I'm kidding. But I mean, I want I a TED talk. Should. Yeah, it's like cave woman biology. You know, that's, that's mm. what I think we're missing out on. Yeah. And it can be simple things. I, I think yes. too, like if you park the car somewhere, don't go to the nearest car park to where you're walking to get yep. the car park furthest away. So you have to walk that little bit further. Exactly. Exactly. Little things like that. Like if you have three biscuits with your morning tea, yeah, cut back to two and then try one. If you have sugar in your coffee and you have yeah. two sugars, try right. one sugar. Like it's tiny things, all these little exactly. achievable things make the sum of together a huge change a thousand percent i love that you said that because that is exactly right and i think we're in a culture where people want instant results mm. and we that's a mindset thing we have to know that little steps will accumulate and make big changes and to be patient have poise and patience and mindfulness and being in the present moment can help with that because if we say, oh, I wish I lost 10 pounds or I wish, you know, you're thinking of the goal. It has to be mindful and just know that time is your friend in this, yes. these yes. little steps. So it goes yes. against society, unfortunately, but that's, we're all mm. going to be rebellious, right? Yes, we're all gonna we, have, take... we are not going to set ourselves up for failure here. We're exactly. Set ourselves up for a win from a yes. judgmental place exactly we have we are empowered we can take control over these things absolutely so in summing up what's the impact yes. of all of this for us as teachers and for the people that they we're working with those students that come into our studios who are anxious mm. how, how do we help those people because i know there's a lot of talk about trauma-informed pedagogy which overlaps into some of this what are your yes. thoughts on all of that well the favorite expression i'll give is you know we try not to use don't language in the studio right it's don't or um someone once said to me it's like don't think of a person in a red suit you know your brain is going to go to that don't i think the issue i have with trauma-informed voice pedagogy is that we are planting a word trauma into a vernacular, into a space where I feel it doesn't belong. That's not saying that people don't have trauma in their lives. It's just that that word is a negative power of suggestion. Um, there is vernacular trauma, sort of how people talk about it. Um, and then there's sort of what's in the literature. And everyone has had trauma Yes. Basically, we could all yes. say I could list things, but what's I think what this trauma informed pedagogy is referring to is actually PTSD, because not all trauma will manifest in something that is so strong in someone now that it needs to be addressed in this moment. Even what just happened to me six weeks ago. I wouldn't say I have PTSD right now, even though that's a trauma. Mm -hmm. But some people would say, maybe take that with them and and use that as something that they want to revisit and revisit. And I don't think that's healthy, but that's just me. I don't maybe don't want to go into that because that can yes. be controversial. And I yes. know it, it yes. is. Yes. But what I want to say is in, in a singer space, we do want to provide a space that doesn't trigger, right? Or that someone feels safe in without overstepping our 
bounds of expertise. Even someone who was trained in trauma-informed vocal pedagogy, it's still not the level of training that I think warrants that serious of a approach. But what I do advocate is empathy informed because we can mm. all be trained to be empathetic. Love, love, love. And so we can all learn to feed, you know, to be able to look at a person empathetically and assess where they're, if someone comes in and they're exhausted, you know, I know I can craft the lesson a little differently to embrace where they're at. Um, we can do things that are maybe, you know, more relaxing. Or if someone comes in anxious, I do what, what I call a homeostasis check. We'll do a couple forward bends, or we'll do some closing our eyes and breathe and imagining vocal things that are still within my purview. I'm not giving them things that are outside of that, but it's like, okay, let's, and, and then they're in the bubble of the room. And I think that's what we want to give them. We want to give them our expertise. They're there to sing after all. That's why they came. They came because they love to sing. They want to sing. And I feel once they've made that step, our job is not to talk about their trauma or figure it out. Our job is to, to have empathy, to give them that bubble where they can experience singing in the fullest way and that I can give my expertise in the fullest way. Mm. And that's sort of how I view it. But yeah. Yeah, it's creating a pathway within mm -hmm. the Singing Boy Studio to access their sound. Right. Without all the, the therapy. Right. And some people say, you know, I've read some papers on, you know, trauma informed just because I wanted to be educated before I, you know, because I had an opinion about it, but I wanted to educate myself. And so one of the things that was brought up is emotions in a piece that can be triggering. So once you're already singing, that singing is a very emotional, creative art form that can trigger things in people. So how do you address that? Again, I think getting into someone's personal boundaries of why they're crying. Sometimes I just, you know, if someone, I've had people cry in my class and I just embraced it because it's beautiful. They're, you know, they're expressing. And other times we can play with a different character that may feel, you know, if it's something that's really sad and heavy, it's like, let's play it like you're a cabaret singer, you know, smoking a cigarette with a glass of scotch. And, you know, mm. that can shift the way they're experiencing the song, you know? Yes. That's such a hard one because I've been in a, a couple of different situations. One, obviously where a student has cried because mm -hmm. they've connected so deeply in that moment in time mm -hmm. with what they were singing. And I just give them a hug. Yeah. I, you know, and I go, wow, that you must've needed that. You know, mm -hmm. like something like that, no judgment. Exactly. I, I have been the student that has cried in someone's lesson yep. and I was given a box of tissues and told to get over it. <gasps> that is not empathy informed pedagogy. No, <laughs> no. And I have been the teacher that has cried when a student mm -hmm. has sung because it was so beautiful. And my students know that I do that and they're okay with that. Yes. I own and, the tears. Yes. And I just say there was such a beauty about what you just did that I just, yeah. that was the response. It's okay. Yeah. And I've checked all those boxes you just checked as well myself. Mm. And I think how you worded it is, is perfect. It's like, I think both, except for the handing the tissue, that's not. No, it was that's not, not, no. no. But I think that idea of, there's empathy in what you do, whether you cry or your student cries. There's also, oh, my thumb went up on that. So there's yes. empathy and there's empathy and there's also you've created a safe space. Mm. And I think that's that's I think that's what we need to do. We don't need to diagnose, we don't need to have a 12-step plan for dealing with someone's trauma or even know what it is. I think it's just you know, someone felt, it's amazing that someone felt vulnerable enough yes. to experience that emotion. Yes. That means they feel 
safe and the singing was a way to express. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I don't want to have to look at anything like that as a negative that I need to react to in a concerned trauma way. It's just, um, and again, there's a million different forms of trauma, but I feel like if they came to that lesson, they're there to sing. And exactly. That's why they're there. They're, and if they wanted to deal with their trauma, they would be going to mm -hmm. a therapist. So mm -hmm. I think that's where we know our role is that they're coming to our space because they want to feel safe and they want to sing. What about you, though, as the teacher? We're going to start wrapping this up then. Yes. Because you've been so kind with your time. No, no, no. What about you as the teacher when you're struggling? Yes. And that's happened recently. I, I found, and I'm, I'm wondering if all teachers feel this, yes. that when I am giving in that setting, I feel better. So that's part yes. of, they call it, they call it generative. Like when I'm being generative, creating and helping and experiencing that thing, I feel better. And I know that about myself. I think yes. if I'm feeling low energy, you know, I will do some breath things or I will, but I'm always giving myself to that student and that makes me feel better. Um, and and what I, about, so what about, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, what no, no. About, yeah. Like, because when my mum passed away last year, yeah. I would check in with myself. I would shower myself and my teaching space with love and kindness. Yes. No judgment and empathy. A thousand percent. Empathy is that two way street yes. for yourself. You know, there's something called, you know, like loving kindness, you know, and I know it sounds hippieish, but there, there is that kind of meditation where you're, you're really, it, it, it has to come from you giving to yourself as well as giving to your student. And I think that is, the healthy way to do it. And then you're creating a positive environment for everybody. Yes. And it's hard to do sometimes when you feel like you've had a loss, you know, um, I went back to teaching about two weeks after this happened yes. and, you know, everybody knew. So everyone was very gracious, but as soon as we started, I just realized being generative, moving, you know, being present was really helpful. And I think it was helpful for the students too. People can sometimes feel, scared if they know something about mm. your personal life to mm -hmm. interact with you. So this mm -hmm. was, this was nice. Yeah. Yes. But empathy informed pedagogy all around. Okay. Well, maybe you need to write about that. Yeah, maybe I will. Maybe that's the next chapter for you. Yeah. yeah. Any last pieces of advice for our singing voice community and beyond in regards to what we've been talking about today? Yeah. I think I want people to leave feeling empowered that we are capable of amazing things as humans. And even though the world right now is not helping us achieve that, there still are paths you can take to, to really find, know yourself and know happiness and know resilience. Um, and again, leading with empathy for yourself and for your students. And whether you're tapping into the brain, the body, the environment, all of those things as a whole, um, there's hope. Beacons of light. I love that. And yeah. if I can add something as well, Heidi. Yes, yes. My, my very first interview with, was, was with Elizabeth Blades, who is a, a very dear friend. And she said in that interview, this too shall pass. Now, I'd never heard that before, believe it or not. Maybe it's not an Australian thing that we say here. But, you know, a lot of what happens and is going on, it is a moment in time. Yes. And next week or tomorrow mm -hmm. or in an hour's time, maybe it will pass and whatever you're thinking in that moment wherever your head is at in that moment if only we can remember that 
you know, because I think about my husband committing suicide. Yeah. And I think, you know what, it was a moment in time. Yes. If only he had allowed the next moment. Yes. Yes. And, and, I, and that's, that's the hard thing. That's the hard pill to swallow. Yes. Because, and, and I, you're, I am so sorry that you went through that. And I had oh, the same, it, yes. I had the same thought that one moment of that decision yes changes everything yes and and knowing what time is and how feelings and and roll and yes this too shall pass seasons have been a metaphor for me sometimes is that Mm, that that natural flow that you will get winter you will get dark you will get sun and but each time you will get sun after the dark and you know whether it's daily things or and it is hard to see when you're in it and yes. it's very hard to see so training that and making people aware so that if they come upon that maybe that little seed will stay in their brains that it will pass like we just want to give one seed of hope to people who are feeling that way and I come across these feelings too sometimes, you know, so I'm I'm speaking to myself too of there can be dark thoughts that have to just know that it will pass. Yes. And you know what? You've always got a friend here. Yeah. And you You too. You know what? You can call me at any time of the night or day if if you need someone to talk to. Thank you. And I say the same to you. I think we need this. Yeah. Sometimes we feel alone. We need to that know that the, there are peop, people are around us and we can feel. So I feel you through the ether. I'm squeezing you right now. Let me see. Oh, wait, I can what? do this. And I think a heart will like, there you go. Look at that. Oh, Sorry, I'm giving a heart. <laughs> I'm giving a heart. So we give our hearts to anyone listening. Yes, that we there do. is hope. You are never alone. And this too shall pass. I love you, my friend. I love you. Thank too. you so Thank much you. for sharing and for being so vulnerable. And Thank you. You I, too. You know, this was not a pity party here, people. This was yeah. not about us looking for attention, seeking anything from anybody. We we decided that we would speak our truth because mm-hmm. we wanted to let people realize that there is hope. Yes, that you're not alone. You're not the only person who is going through what you're going through. And we love you and we care for you. And please seek help. Yes, if you're suffering, don't you don't need to do this by yourself. Yes. Anyway, what are you up to next? What am I up to now? Well, it's going to be Thanksgiving here in the US. So we get to cook and eat. But my daughter's coming home from college tonight. And so I'm really thinking of family right now and just giving my attention to that. And I'm singing a Messiah, like all of her sopranos in the world. Handel's Messiah season. So I get to rejoice greatly. Wow, amazing. (laughs) And do you know what, what we'll do too is share any links to any papers or anything that you have that you yes. think would be beneficial for our listeners too. But yes. thank you so much thank for your you. time, Heidi. And thank you yes. as always. I adore you. I adore I'm gonna, you too. I want to kidnap you and, and put you in a figurine and have you sit on my desk so I can talk to you all the time. I want to put you in my swear jar. <laughs> I want to live in your swear jar. <laughs> that would be great. Take okay. care, my friend. You be too. Good. Enjoy you. your holiday.